I'm Managing Editor Kim Schmidt on the road visiting dealerships. Welcome to On the Record. Here's a look at what's currently impacting the ag equipment industry. Yesterday, the Equipment Dealers Association announced its Dealer's Choice Awards based on the association's 2016 Dealer Manufacturer Relations Survey. The Dealer Choice Award is presented to manufacturers receiving the highest ratings in 12 categories covering operations and support. Recipients for the 2016 Dealer's Choice Awards are Full Line Manufacturer John Deere, Tractor Manufacturer LS Tractor, Short Line Manufacturer Vermeer, and Outdoor Power Equipment Manufacturer Grasshopper. Since the award's inception in 2013, Vermeer has achieved the top rating in the Short Line Manufacturer category all four years. John Deere, Ellis Tractor, and Grasshopper topped their respective categories for the second consecutive year. EDA also bestows gold level recognition to the manufacturers that receive exceptional overall ratings. The farm equipment manufacturers receiving gold level status include Tractor Manufacturers Branson Tractor, Coyote Tractor, and Kubota, Short Line Manufacturers Burgo Industries, Kloss, Dagelman, Great Plains, H&S Manufacturing, Coon North America, Land Pride, Landall, Macdon Industries, Meyer Manufacturing, Unverfurth Manufacturing, and Woods. Further coverage of the EDA Dealer Manufacturer Relations Survey and its 2016 award winners will be featured in the July-August edition of Farm Equipment Magazine. Dealers on the move this week include Stoats Equipment, Canada West Harvest Center, Atlanta Kubota, and Matt Squy Ag Repair. John Deere dealer Stoats Equipment is acquiring Christensen Implements three stores in Burley, Twin Falls, and American Falls, Idaho. The deal is expected to close August 1st. This brings Stoats' total locations to 25. Class is opening its third Canada West Harvest Center location in Saskatchewan. The new store in Swift Current is set to open in time for the 2016 harvest and joins locations in Regina and Saskatoon. Atlanta Kubota held a grand opening of its new facility in Marietta, Georgia on May 20th. The new facility is 45,000 square feet and includes the largest air-conditioned Kubota showroom in the state of Georgia. Finally, short-line equipment dealer Matt Squy Ag Repair in Abbotsford, British Columbia has joined the JCB Dealer Network. Their other lines include Deutz Farr, McCormick, Coyote, Kuhn, and McHale. Now here's Jack Zemlicka with the latest from the Technology Corner. Thanks, Kim. At the pinnacle of the precision farming boom, technology specialists were in high demand, while supply was relatively low. But as the farm machinery market has slowed, so too have precision hiring plans for most OEM dealers, according to Ag Equipment Intelligence's 2016 Dealer Business Outlook and Trends Report. In 2013, more than 54% of John Deere dealers planned to add specialists to their precision farming departments compared to about 17% in 2016. Looking at that same four-year window, precision hiring plans for Case IH dealers declined 30%, AECO dealers by 21%, and New Holland dealers by 17%, according to the Outlook and Trends report. Overall, precision hiring plans by North American OEM dealers fell from a five-year high of 28% in 2013 to a low of 13% this year. But the one exception to the downward hiring trend is Kubota. The manufacturer made news with its recent acquisition of Great Plains and appears poised to become more of a player in the precision farming market. According to the report, nearly 24% of Kubota dealers plan to hire precision specialists in 2016, the highest of any of the major OEMs. The percentage is especially noteworthy given that in 2013, only 6% of Kubota dealers plan to hire precision specialists, and five years ago, there weren't any, according to the Outlook and Trends report. Back to you, Kim. Thanks, Jack. Over the last four weeks, we've seen a nice increase in corn and soybean prices, with corn rising above $4 and soybeans over $10. This represents a psychological threshold for farmers. Generally, when crop prices go above $4 per bushel for corn and $10 for soybeans, farmer sentiment tends to improve. When farmers are in a good mood, it's good news for farm equipment dealers and manufacturers. 
Last week, I sat down with Don Van Howling, owner and general manager of Van Wall Equipment, a 16-store John Deere dealer based in Iowa. He's already begun to see an improvement in farmer attitude, which is translating into equipment sales. Van Howling says if crop prices can hold steady at this level, we could see a pickup in farm equipment sales during the second half of the year. When we were at that 350, uh, 950 level on corn and soybeans, that was at best a break even. There was no profit there. And so our customers were well aware of that and knowing such really didn't feel like they were in a position to add any investment to their operation. Now that we're looking at the opportunity for $4.50 and $11 beans, there's profit opportunity for the grower. So um, over the last two weeks now, we've seen an increase in interest in equipment. And just as an example of today, we, you know, we've already sold two new tractors and two, two used balers. So um, it really is amazing how much the value of commodities affects how the farmer feels about his business because he knows now when he's making money and when he's not because he's got a pretty good hand on his production costs. So if the value of these commodities can hold, that's going to add additional strength. But a lot of our producers now do a lot of um, hedge to arrive contracts based on what they think their crop's going to look like and can lock in a good portion of these prices right now on at least half of their crop. And, and a number of them are doing that. So that gives them a confidence that they got their, they got their fixed costs covered and now uh, the next shot will be, can I cover those variable costs and add some value to it? So there's an opportunity now for profit and that changes the whole mindset of the producer. Titan Machinery, Case IH's largest dealer group, reported its first quarter financial results for fiscal 2017 on May 26. Total revenue came in at $285 million, a 19.3% decline from the first quarter of fiscal 2016. Egg revenues for the quarter were $179 million, down 25.5% year over year. The dealership sold $25 million of the $74 million targeted aged equipment inventory during the first quarter. This was above management's $22 million target. Titan CFO Mark Calvota says the dealership is on track to achieve its goal of a $100 million reduction of equipment inventory in fiscal 2017. They expect the quarterly inventory stocking trend to be similar to that of fiscal 2016, with most of the reduction occurring in the back half of the year, particularly in the fourth quarter. By the end of fiscal 2017, Calvota says they expect to have reduced equipment inventory by approximately $450 million or 48% compared to the end of fiscal 2014, which represents a major improvement in the strength of Titan's balance sheet. In an effort to boost farm equipment sales in Southeast Asia and support a graying Japanese ag sector, Kubota and Nippon Telegraph and Telephone are teaming up to develop autonomous farm equipment, according to a report in the Nikkei Asian Review. The two Japanese companies will partner together on new precision farming service for farmers, which they plan to use to help put autonomous equipment on the market. They have a target of 2018 to roll out the program. According to the report, the new service will use sensors positioned around rice paddies to measure temperature and water levels. This data, along with crop images taken by drones, will be used to analyze growth. The system will then determine when to fertilize and harvest each paddy and will send the appropriate directions to equipment via the internet. And now from the Implement and Tractor archives, the J.I. Case Threshing Machine Company, based in Racine, Wisconsin, primarily dealt in harvesting equipment, but for a time built cars as well, and saw opportunity that the first International 500 provided. The company had three drivers in the 1911 lineup, but none of them finished the race. One crashed and the other two dropped out with steering failures. The Case team was popular, according to company history, with its drivers and riding mechanics neatly attired in khaki racing suits and red turtlenecks adorned with white eagles. Its racing cars were never competitive, though. Louis Disbrow was the only case driver to finish the 500, eighth in 1913, the final year of the program. According to company history, Case wasn't competitive in the marketplace either. A company that built automobiles as a sideline couldn't keep up with the industry and got out of the business in 1927. As always, we welcome your feedback. You can send comments and story suggestions to kschmidt at lessetermedia.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.